Okay, today our presentation is going to be on theories of personality and to give you our usual overview um, we'll talk just briefly about situational strength and after that we'll move into the theories which include the behavioral and the cognitive behavioral approach which is also called the social cognition approach and then we'll look briefly at trait theories and we'll cover that one quickly because it's covered in your personality module then we'll go to psychoanalytic views, which includes Freud and Neo-Freudians. We'll talk just a little bit about projective tests and why those are important in psychoanalytic views of personality. Then we'll move to the humanistic view and talk about Carl Rogers' particular contributions. But before we get started, um, some people make comments like, I don't believe in personality tests, I don't think they work, and some of them really are not valid. You have to kind of be careful to choose one that's professionally developed. But another reason that personality scales do not predict is that um, there's a variable called situational strength that you have to consider. So effects of personality are always moderated or dependent on situational strength. A strong situation encourages conformity and weakens effects of personality. Like singing in a church choir, you can't tell who's introverted and who's extroverted, for instance, because there are so many rules for how to behave that personality is kind of washed out. In contrast, a weak situation has fewer confining norms. And for instance, a band where people feel more relaxed and it's much more informal, you can kind of tell a little bit about the band members by how much eye contact they make in the audience and how outgoing they are. Now let's talk about some theories of personality, starting with the behavioral or learning approach, and then we'll move into an extension of this approach called the social cognitive or cognitive behavioral approach. And basically, remember, behaviorists are going to believe that you are a product of your past rewards or your past punishments. Learning history is the focus, and this is nothing more than that history of rewards and punishments. A critique of the behavioral approach is that when you're talking about these environmental punishments or rewards, they're often broadly defined, so it's difficult to understand what made a person unique. And we also see, even for siblings raised in very similar situations, that they might have very different traits, and so we want to understand how the environment influences us. Now, this kind of questioning of the basic behavioral approach led to an offshoot called the cognitive behavioral or the social cognitive approach. And so it has all the strengths of learning theory or behaviorism, but it also adds in cognitive considerations. So it adds in the fact that you might have individual differences in belief systems that change the way that you as an individual respond to environmental events, particularly to challenging or rewarding events. <clears throat> this theory also suggests that you learn behaviors and styles from watching other people. You don't have to experience a reward and a punishment yourself to change your own behavior. For example, if you were in a course and a student asked a question of the professor and the professor, instead of answering it, made them look it up and present it next time in class, unfortunately, that person's taught you not to ask questions in class, right? Because you're not going to ask one if you watch somebody else get punished for it. Now, this kind of learning occurs even in young children, and Bandura conducted a very famous study on aggression and how this is learned by children. Basically, what happens in this little clip that you'll see is that children watch an adult play either peacefully or aggressively. And the children who watched an adult play aggressively, especially when they were rewarded for this kind of play, when they were allowed to play, the children were, they were actually more aggressive too. So they learned aggression from this adult role model. And so you can copy or just type this into your browser. It's a link in YouTube called The Brain, A Secret History, Emotions, 
Bandura Bobo doll experiment. And Bandura is spelled B-A-N-D-U-R-A, and Bobo doll is uh, B-O-B-O doll experiment. So the brain is secret history, emotions, Bandura Bobo doll experiment. And a Bobo doll is just an inflatable doll that you can punch. It's kind of life-sized, and when you punch it, it comes right back at you. But you'll see when you see the clip. So the other contribution of social cognitive or social learning theory is that it deals with individual differences in how people handle um, these kind of different environmental events. So it's going to look at specific beliefs, and we're going to take the time to look at one belief system in particular called locus of control. And locus just means location of control. This was developed by a guy named Rotter. So he spent most of his life measuring this locus of control. If you want to see where you stand on locus of control, you can go to the link www.psych, and that's P S Y C H dot U N C C dot E D U slash P A G O O L K A slash LC slash, I'm sorry, LC dot HTML. Or if this is the um, non audio, you can also just kind of uh, click on the link. So this will take you to a locus of control measure, which makes it more interesting when you know where you stand. So according to Rotter, if you're internal locus of control, you control a lot of outcomes in your life. So you might set goals for yourself, and you might really pursue those goals. In contrast, if you're more external, then your uh, belief system is that external forces, like luck and chance, are more important. And just like everything in life, there's no one perfect style. The internal locus of control people tend to be more goal-oriented than externals, but they also kind of beat themselves up more if they don't achieve something that they expect they should have. Uh, external locus of control people tend to be a little more laid back when they don't achieve something because they realize that even though you can set goals, there are outside forces that are important. Trait theory is covered in your personality module, so all I'm going to do is put the big five up there, and you can refer to your module for definitions. And those are conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, openness, and neuroticism. And those are just... Um, descriptions of how people are. So trait theory doesn't try to describe where the behavior comes from or the traits. It just tells you um, your standing on each one. And it's important to know that with age, these traits become more stable, and they're typically pretty stable from college age all the way into your 60s. Another thing to bear in mind is these trait measures predict average behavior. So they're better at predicting differences among individuals than they are at describing one human being. Psychoanalytic theory is an unusual theory of personality that was developed by Freud, and the emphasis, not surprisingly, is on unconscious conflicts and early childhood. Now, there are dimensions of personality in Freudian theory. Remember that he thought that most of our personality was unconscious. And so to Freud, two of the parts of the personality that are unconscious are the id and the superego. The id operates on the pleasure principle. In other words, this is a part of you that just pushes you to do whatever feels good. So you might, for instance, procrastinate on homework by watching a movie because it just feels good. You're not really thinking about the consequences of it. In contrast, the superego is also unconscious, but it's kind of the goody-goody in your personality. And so the superego consists of morality. Now, the funny thing about the id and the superego is that they're both unrealistic. The id, because it's more pleasure-oriented, and the superego, because it can push you to unrealistic standards of perfection. As you would guess, the id and superego are going to come into conflict. For instance, if you're a, basically you're a good person, you're in a committed relationship, and you go out and meet somebody who's really attractive and they ask you out, the id would be the voice telling you to do it, and the superego would be the voice saying that's wrong. 
Now, if the conflict is um, kind of harsh enough, then you'll start to become aware of the tension. It's almost as if you're arguing with yourself. And this is where the ego comes in. The ego, contrary to the way the term is used in popular language, actually is a positive force. A big ego means you have a lot of reason or rationality. And so the ego is kind of a referee between the id and the superego. And again, Freud believed that much of our personality was not conscious or was unconscious. The ego is the part that's mostly conscious. Freud also had psychosexual stages of personality development, and these are stages that are centered around the body part that's supposed to bring the most pleasure at a given age. The mouth or the oral area is from birth to two years, the anal from uh, two to three years, and according to Freud, this phase is very important. It's when toilet training occurs, and so to Freud, if you have a great toilet training experience and your parents reward you, you become anal expulsive or generous and kind and giving, kind of disorganized. If your parents are upset and strict in toilet training, then you become anal retentive, which means you're over-controlled both with your own behavior and that of others. The phallic stage just refers to a phallus or a penis and again gets at the sexuality of Freudian theory. This happens from about age three to six years and it does hold a conflict for boys and girls. For little boys, this is where the Oedipal conflict occurs. During the Oedipal conflict, according to Freud, um, he believed that little boys fall in love with their mother and they actually want to marry her. And they resolve this conflict, if they do indeed resolve it, by identifying psychologically with their father. For instance, you may have heard people say, well, that guy really married his mother. That's one way of resolving the conflict, to marry someone who reminds you of your mom. The latency period, latent just means hidden, is from age 6 to puberty, and there's a real lack of interest in sexuality here. And then finally, there's the genital phase from puberty to adulthood. And as you've noticed, Freud has a really strong sexual emphasis from childhood on, and this is unique and unusual in psychological theory. Now, according to Freud, you don't necessarily work through each of these phases. You may become fixated, which he referred to as an excessive focus of psychic energy at a particular phase. For instance, if you're orally fixated, you may smoke too much, eat too much, talk too much. Um, again, the pleasure is coming from the mouth. Now, lots of problems with this theory, as I'm sure you know already, just from listening to it. It's kind of an odd way to frame human behavior. One of the big problems was falsifiability. You can't test it. Um, it's not something, you can't ask people, for instance, who are in their 30s about toilet training. Most of us don't even remember anything about it. So you can't test out any of that That piece of the theory. Also, he based all of his theory on a very small clinical sample and then said it applied to everybody. And that's generally thought of as um, not sound practice. It is not sound practice. And finally, there's an over-reliance on childhood memory. And we already have learned that childhood memory is very unreliable. Now, if you want to learn more about Freud, you can um, just copy that link if you want. An easier way to do it in this audio version is go to YouTube and type in Sigmund Freud, and that's spelled F-R-E-U-D, the father of psychoanalysis. Now, some of Freud's followers thought that he put too much emphasis on sex and the unconscious in early childhood, so they broke with him, and they were called Neo-Freudians or New Freudians, the most famous of which is Carl Jung. And Carl Jung believed that there are many, many other forces that were at work other than just the ones Freud's, Freud believed. And he had some unusual theories which are intriguing. One is the collective unconscious, which suggests that we're not born a blank slate. We're actually born with some universal broad-based memories inherited from our ancestors. Just as one example of this, uh, memory of the importance of good prevailing and good versus evil would be a universal ancient memory. 
An archetype is a repeated symbol of these memories. For instance, the good versus evil memory is symbolized by our fascination with superheroes. We're always fascinated with those, and we have been in different shapes and forms throughout the ages. Up until today, we love to see superheroes prevail over evil. If you want to learn more about Young, you can go to YouTube and just type in documentary on Carl, C-A-R-L, Gustav, G-U-S-T-A-V, Young, J-U-N-G, and you're going to be looking at part one of two. Let's talk about the importance of projective tests and psycho psychoanalysis. Um, projective test basically consists of an ambiguous stimulus, a visual stimulus, that you show somebody and ask them what they see. And so you look for kind of repeated themes in what they see, and those themes are supposed to reveal something about the person. Since the image could describe a lot of different scenarios, the scenario that you see as an individual in these ambiguous pictures tells the psychologist something about yourself. As an example, here's the uh, ink blot test, one card from it, and it's called um, a projective test because, again, it's just kind of ambiguous. This one is called the Rorschach ink blot test. So you can kind of look at that and see that there are lots of different images that you might see in there. The slide on the next test is called the thematic apperception test, and it's just a different kind of projective test. So you can see this could be interpreted in lots and lots of different ways. And so the psychoanalytic psychologist would show you many different images and look for themes. The humanistic view is quite different from the Freudian view. The Freudian view is kind of pessimistic since it thinks that we're ruled by these unconscious forces in very early childhood. In contrast, humanists think that we have more free will and they have a very positive outlook. They believe that we can understand how to develop ourselves by examining the best kinds of people like Mother Teresa. They also believe in unconditional positive regard as a general concept and a concept that should be shown in therapy. Carl Rogers came up with this term, and it basically means that you should show other human beings love and support without conditions or limits. For instance, if you only show your parents affection when they act in the way that you want them to act, that's conditional positive regard. When you're affectionate to them and loving, even if they do something that you don't agree with or even if they treat you in a way that um, you may not agree with, that's unconditional. Now, notice this doesn't mean that you have to accept uh, unkind or abusive behavior. It just means that too often we bring kind of a selfish attitude toward our interaction and our love of others. Now, if you want to learn more about Carl Rogers, you can just type into YouTube Carl, C-A-R-L, Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S, on empathy, E-M-P-A-T-H-Y. And I think this gives you a better feel for unconditional positive regard. Let's take a brief look at some cultural influences on personality. One example of this is that collectivist cultures like India and China place great emphasis on the group, whereas individualistic countries like the United States put a lot of emphasis on individual achievement, and this leads to the expression of different personality traits. Individualism is kind of a focus on the I, and so we identify ourselves even uh, according to personal attributes that we have. Whether you're an athlete or a scholar or an engineering or a psychology major, that's part of your identity. In collectivist culture, you identify yourself more based on the identity of groups rather than your own individual uh, identity. So it makes for a very different perspective. Well, that concludes our personality lecture, and I hope that you enjoyed that.